Awesome. Thank you so much, Bang Bang Khan, for sticking with us here to the very end. I'm delighted to be here. And uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about one of my favorite things, which is how did we get from there to here? In this case, about Unix login and the terminals that we use. So that's going to help to give context for a lot of questions that I wonder about, and maybe some of you do. Things like, why is the traditional Unix editor ed so terse in its output? Um, when you're playing the Colossal Cave Adventure, why does it only type the room description to you once, and then you have to say show every time after that? Uh, why is the program that you're using called a terminal emulator in the first place? Um, all, all of these questions kind of come out of this history. There's really three overlapping eras in this history. As I see it, there's the era of paper teletypes, an era of video display terminals, or glass TTYs if you are really old, in your, in your soul anyway. <laughs> and then you get into the, to the modern era of microcomputers and workstations. In each one of these eras, support for the new technology gets added in a backwards compatible way, and then the new technology takes over as the old equipment gets retired. So we'll start with paper teletypes. So paper teletypes were invented back in the mid-1800s, and they looked kind of like this and were utterly impractical, and so Morse code was still better. By the early 1900s, you had things like this Morecambe printing teletype here from 1908, which were faster and easier to use than Morse code, and so printing teletypes took over for Morse code for wire transfer of news, things like that. And, and something like this, it's basically two connected electric typewriters. You type in Chicago and it shows up in LA. So by the mid-1960s, when computing was switching from batch-oriented to time-sharing, a teletype was the obvious choice for a user input device for a time-sharing system. And that gets us to the start of Unix. So in 1969, Bell Labs had just pulled out of a big time-sharing project, and the management was afraid that researchers would keep going on it sort of underground, and so they wouldn't let anybody buy a computer big enough to run Maltics. Um, folks like Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, who you see here sitting in front of a PDP-11, um, they liked the feeling of camaraderie and collaboration that you got from using a time-sharing system. So they wanted a time-sharing system, and they tried several times to buy a big computer and got shot down. But they found a PDP-7, which was completely obsolete and just sitting collecting dust in a different department, and somehow, through shenanigans, they got time on it and wrote Unix on it. Um, in those days, login was always local or virtually local because you had a teletype connected to a serial line or over dial-up connection. And so the device nodes that represented those serial interfaces got named dev TTY number because that was the teletype that was plugged into it. Even in these early days, there was a lot of complexity. In the first edition manual, 1971, we see that init is doing heuristic auto detection between teletype model 37s and GE Terminate 300s. By the next year, they supported the IBM 2741, which means on-the-fly conversion between ASCII and EBICDIC. Oh my god. Um, a few years later, by 1975, the sixth edition manual documents the STTY command providing package options so that after you log in, you run the right package for the brand of terminal you're sitting in front of, and it magically makes everything work for you. Um, and this is because whatever terminals were available were the ones in use, and you want to make things as easy for the user as possible. So in the 70s into the late 80s, you get into the era of, era of video display terminals. Um, the first were not very impressive, but they improved rapidly. So I'm just going to quick show some pictures of some influential video display terminals. So the very first video display terminals, the data point 3300 that you see here, and it's really a glass teletype. It has a very limited feature set. It emulates a paper teletype, but it doesn't require paper and it's not loud. They were really expensive, much more expensive than a teletype. I never found any evidence that they were actually used on Unix systems, but here they are. This kind of started the trend. Um, 1975, this, tele this terminal, the ADM3, was released, and it set a record for low price for a glass teletype. Um, so these got adopted by Berkeley. They didn't need them at Bell because they had all these teletypes, paper teletypes. But Berkeley took these because this was around when Berkeley was starting to use Unix, and they were cheap. 
1978, the VT100, some folks may recognize this one. This was really like the, one of the first video display terminals that was really good and started doing a lot of things besides just emulating a paper terminal. It uh, has today's standard 80 by 24 characters, which is part of why when you open up a terminal window on your Mac, that's the size it comes out to. And it was the first terminal to support the newly standardized ANSI escape sequences. So if you want to move the cursor around on the screen, you just have your uh, program emit certain uh, high ASCII characters, and the cursor moves for you. 1983, the VT220 came out, which was smaller, cheaper, faster, and better, and completely dominated the market. So by this time, you've got a lot of features that you didn't have on paper teletypes. And so you needed more software to handle that diversity. Um, the first BSD release in 1978 included an editor called EX, which you might all know as VI, and the term cap library to support it. So you have a database of terminals and what features they support, and an API that applications can call to do certain operations in a device agnostic way, but doesn't really have a lot of the uh, fancy features that, that, glass, that glass terminals could support. Um, the first release supported 22 types of terminals, 50 types a year later in the second BSD release, and this box running 1804 has 1,700 in that database. This is why if you set your term environment variable wrong, bad things start to happen to your screen redraw. In 1980, 4BSD included Curses, which was an optimized screen repaint library, and then you can build really fancy stuff. You can build graphical applications in the terminal, like Rogue here, which is sort of the killer app for libcurses. Um, toward, the, uh, toward the end of the 80s, video terminals started to turn into workstations. And the canonical example here is the Stanford University Network workstation, which, if you turn it into an initialism, tells you where Sun came from. And it's a glass terminal with a good CPU and a network connection, and it booted Unix from a local disk, so that was, that was pretty cool. Um, by the late 80s, workstations, Macs, and PCs had gotten really good. In 1987, the X-Window system version 11 was released with a license change to MIT license. It immediately became hugely popular. Um, 1987, BSD, um, BSD Screen came out, which lets people have a lot of these options even on serial terminals rather than being on X11. Mac TCP in 1988. Winsock in 1992 means that by this time, whatever you've got that's a computer has everything it needs to be on the network and be a good network citizen. So by 1995, video terminals were pretty much extinct, replaced by terminal emulator programs. Features continued to proliferate after terminal emulators took over, started being able to do things that you couldn't do on the VT220, like color and support for clicking the mouse on a character cell and having the program take action based on that, uh, setting the title of the window, and you can see all three of those features in this screenshot of the Aptitude Package Manager for Debian system. You can move around this menu at the top of the screen using the keyboard, but if you absentmindedly click on it, it actually works, which was kind of <laughs> horrifying to me the first time it happened. <laughs> In 1995, uh, login changed again because by then we were starting to realize that networks aren't always friendly places to be, and so Telnet gets replaced with SSH so that you can't just steal everybody's passwords by sniffing the traffic. <laughs> so it's 50 years since the PDP-7 at Bell Labs, but today when you log into a Unix machine, your shell still talks to an abstracted, virtualized teletype. So design decisions from those days are still affecting us now. And the technology and the terminals that you're using influence what software is being written and how it's used. Like I said, um, Bell owned the teletype company, so they had plenty of high-end paper terminals around, and whereas Berkeley bought cheap ADM3 dumb terminals, and that's why we got Ed from Bell Labs and VI from uh, Berkeley, because Ed is actually a really good editor if you're using a typewriter that can emit one line at a time and that is very slow to do everything, whereas VI was born in this era where you had reduced output latency, so you could use that to be more user-friendly. 
So overall, this, this technological trend is toward lower input latency, lower output latency for greater interactivity, but with backwards compatibility. In each case, you start with what's already there. You don't throw it away. You take your thing, you make sure that your thing is as good as the previous thing, and then you continue to build on it. And so that's why when you use you know, a local shell on a Linux box or you putty into a host, it's, that's why the TTY is, is capitalized in putty, because it's still all mostly compatible. There's a ton, ton, ton of information here. So if you think this is cool, here's some things you can search for on the internet to kind of start to going down this rabbit hole yourself. It's been a lot of fun for me, and I've been really glad to share it with you. Thanks a lot for your time.